We praise God for everyone being here. We are in the book of Revelation, and we're in chapter 4, if you want to turn there today. We are working our way through in more of a survey fashion because you could spend a long time in this book. Man, look at this. Back in the back, we've got uh, some long-lost friends back there. Welcome. So we're glad everybody's here. It's good to have everyone with us. In chapter 4, what we find in this book, uh, before actually, if, in fact, before we get into it, I just want a, a couple of quick warnings as to why we're not doing the book for these particular reasons. We're not doing it so that we can try to directly correlate every current event with, with the cryptic warnings of Revelation. Sometimes people try to look at every current event and say, hey, what is, let me tie that specifically to this warning in Scripture, and you can, you can end up making some pretty outlandish uh, statements about what is and isn't going on in regards to, oh, I'm sure this is Revelation or this is what's happening in, from Daniel. We want to be careful about that. In fact, uh, Jesus warned us in a passage that we're going to dig into much more next week in Matthew 24, but he says in verse 3, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will, be the th when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus sa answered and said to them, see to it, no one misleads you. And so we're tempted to be misled in this, right? For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will hear a hearing of wars and rumors of war. See to it that you are not frightened. So we don't need to worry about current events. We just need to be wise, right? For those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famine and earthquake. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. So we don't want to try to directly correlate every event to one of the warnings here. We just want to know, in general, the scripture teaches us that there's seasons that we can perceive and that these nations rising against nations and these natural disasters will increase and grow as we near the end. And so also we want to avoid uh, treating revelation as irrelevant or unknowable. And that's also the other extreme is to say, hey, this book's tough. It is tough. There's a lot of symbolism in the book which makes it much more challenging at times, at points. But a lot of people take the view as a result that I don't really need to know the end. I'll just avoid the book. But here's what Revelation 1-3 says. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. So we want to not only not try to look at the newspaper tomorrow or the news tomorrow and, and evaluate every event based on, hey, where is this, what verse am I attaching it to? We want to avoid that. We also want to avoid the idea that it's irrelevant or unknowable. God expects you to know the end. He expects to encourage all of us by sharing us with the end so that we can not only be encouraged, hey, we win. We don't need to be anxious over all this stuff. And also, we should be motivated. When we know the end, we should be motivated to tell some people about Jesus. So that's the main goals, and we want to avoid those two dangers, but also... We're not looking to get into endless eschatological, um, eschatology being the study of end times. We don't want to get into endless eschatological debates as a church either. As a church, we take a, what we call premillennial, not we call, what they call, it's known that it's called that way, premillennialism. That is, we take it to be that God is, is uh, working in a way that he will come back and reign for a thousand years. There are a lot of views on Revelation it is not the first tier issue. We can lock arms together for the gospel to love one another and serve one another and reach the city, even if we disagree on these particular points. And so as a church, while we embrace premillennialism, it is not a means by which or a measure by which whether we'll lock arms with somebody for the gospel. And that's why in the Key Issues booklet, we do not list out a particular eschatological view, just like we don't hold out a particular mode of baptism, that we do baptism by immersion. And if you were sprinkled and believe as a believer you were sprinkled, and that, that's fine too, although we believe that baptism is by uh, for believers. So there's a lot of different views out there, and we hold to the essentials as that which we lock arms together for, and we can have differences in the other without ending up in long debate. So that's just sort of a, uh, a precursor. As a quick review, chapter 1, we got a lot different picture of Jesus, didn't we? Chapter 1, you have Jesus, and he symbolizes having eyes with flaming fire. They burn right through. His focus is on the church, and he's looking with these eyes that burn through things to see the reality of the situation, his feet of burnished bronze. It talks about his willingness as he's walking among the churches to deal with, to admonish 
sin. He's wearing a robe and, and girded across it with a golden sash, and it's, and it's picturing his, his priestly role of, of interceding and bringing us to the Father and, and dealing with uh, 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 as a mediator for us between us and the Father. And so, so we have this symbolic thing, and instead of uh, a picture that sometimes people are like, oh, you know, they, they, they share these different things about, I went to heaven, I saw this, and one person was saying, and we, I splashed around in the, in the river of life with Jesus, and and you look at the scriptures and you say, wow, when John saw Jesus, he fell as a dead man. He saw a being that wasn't anything like the Jewish peasant who once walked the earth. Even though he was exactly the same in his glorified state, he no longer looked as the gentle Jewish carpenter, but more the Lord of the universe, right? So he's both, and we need an appropriate picture of Jesus. So chapter 1 also gave us a format of uh, sort of a layout of the book. In verse 19, it says, Therefore, write the things which you've seen, and so that's the prophecy, and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. The things which are, Jesus was focused on the church. And so we looked at last week the seven churches. I believe Jesus is just as focused on the church today. I believe he's just as committed to rewarding the church today and just as quick to admonish the church today. I believe that throughout all the, the, the time of the church age, I believe Jesus is intently involved in the church, and we should be looking at that in our lives corporately and individually to see that Jesus is very, very dedicated to us coming to follow him in an appropriate worshipful way. So with that said, we transition into the final section of this book, which, according to verse ni- chapter 1, verse 19, are things which will take place after these things. And then chapter 4, verse 1, he says, after these things. So after he's gotten the prophecy, he, he talked about how he's looking at the churches, and by extension, it's a warning to all churches in all ages. And after these things. But before he jumps into what are some very weighty issues, really tough issues in consideration of a, a day where we have sort of a hallmark Christianity, I often drive by and read the signs on churches, and there's a lot of great churches. And yet, we live in a day where uh, there can be a lot of people who are just simply trying to say, hey, four steps to a better marriage, and three steps to better finances, and uh, five rules for a better home. And there can be place for helping us to work through and come up with practical steps. But sometimes what gets missed is the attitude towards this being we call God. Sometimes we see him as too distant, but maybe as a culture at times we see him as uh, too too much like us. We, We understand him to be like us, we like that he's a friend of sinners, but sometimes maybe we forget the reverential attitude and the respect and the fear of sinning against him in light of who he is. So chapters 4 and 5 that we're gonna deal with today, he God throws open a heavenly scene, it's a picture of heaven, and uh, in a day where you have books and movies and such on uh, this person went to heaven, this person went to heaven, uh, you know, whatever those, the case is on those things, I hope you understand that you don't need a child to have an experience for you to have confidence in what heaven is or anything like that. The Holy Spirit weighing upon John told us exactly and gave us a heavenly picture of exactly what heaven is like. And I'll be honest with you, as I read through it this week and read through it this week and meditate on this week and thought, wow, dude, I would so like to be preaching on Philippians 1, right? Because this is tough. This is important because this is, if you could throw open the curtains of heaven, if you could get a glimpse into heaven today, would you want to see it? And if you could see it, would it be what you're expecting? But I want to tell you that John had the curtains of heaven thrown open and God told him to record what he saw so that all generations would understand what they're heading for. And so you need to know because maybe Jesus is different than you're thinking. Maybe what you're heading for is not what you're hoping for. And so we need to understand what we're heading for so that we can know what we're not only hoping for but how we're to live in light of that. So in chapter 4, in this final section, the beginning of this final section, What I want to show you today is that Jesus is not like us. Jesus is not like us. Sometimes we wonder in Matthew 24 and in Revelation why such horrific things will come upon mankind. In fact, in Matthew 24, such things as 
He says in chapter 24, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, and then he will sit. Actually, that's the wrong one. That's 25. 24 says this, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of elect, those were days were cut short. A tribulation that the world has never known. A tribulation that will never be eclipsed again. There will never be such horrific times. A, t- a time on earth where, in fact, if he hadn't cut it short, not a single person would have survived it. Now that's some kind of tribulation. And, and you and I might wonder, why would a good God allow horrific stuff? That sounds like the flood, doesn't it? Where God's so tired of man that while there were millions on this earth, God flooded and destroyed the earth. And while someone to make it a localized thing, you can find evidence of a flood. Even sea creatures embedded into the fossil record at the top of the Himalaya mountains. Why? Because when we read the scriptures, we understand there was a worldwide flood. Well, there's also a worldwide catastrophe. And some wonder, why would a good God do that? I think chapter 4 leads us to uh, understand that Jesus is not like us. And we would like Jesus to be like us because we think that he would be more moral at times. In fact, it's just the opposite. If we were more like Jesus, we would be more moral. He says this, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open. You want to see into heaven today? You would love to see a glimpse into it? This is exactly what John saw. A door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. So he's going to give him a glimpse of the future. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he, was, he, and he who was sitting was like, what you'll find is in these prophecies, he uses the word like a lot. Well, it was like this, it was like that. In other words, how do you describe it? If you could throw up in the, the window of heaven today and get a glimpse into it, you would have a hard time describing it because all we know is what this world, right? And yet heaven is very, very different from what we're talking. So, and he was sitting on, was like, this is Jesus, remember Jesus is not like, not like us, was sitting, was like, so he wasn't the stone, he was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the, around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. I'm not going to try to explain to you all of these things, I'm just going to say, Jesus is not like us, all right? Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their head. So there's a throne, there's Jesus on the throne, there's 24 thrones around the throne, and I'm not even going to tell you that I understand fully who's sitting on the thrones. Some would say, hey, these are people from the church age. Certainly you have 12 tribes and you have 12 apostles, makes 24, who knows? I don't. I'll just be honest with you. Maybe you do. But I know that they're sitting on a throne, around the throne. There's 24 thrones. And they're sitting in white garments and with golden crowns on their head. And verse 5, out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. So you can imagine this this throne with this rainbow around it. It looks like an emerald. And he who sits on it is like Jasper. And he's trying to describe this setting. And there's flashes of lightning and thunder. Because what? He's about to do what? He's about to judge mankind, right? It would have been a terrifying sight. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was like something like a sea of glass. Why does he say something like a sea of glass? Because it isn't a sea of glass. It's just that was how he could experience it. And so the sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, Four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. Some people want to know, hey, hey, is there extraterrestrial life? Are there other life forms out there? NASA spends a whole lot of money. Stephen Hawkins, a uh, billionaire philanthropist out of, out of uh, Russia, have put $100 million up for grabs for anyone who could prove life outside of uh, Earth. In other words, extraterrestrial life. There is life besides us. It's a whole different realm of life besides us, the scripture says. No, it's not aliens. 
It's angels. But if you look at these angels and think about the description of it and think about the movies you've seen that talk about aliens or whatever, listen to this. The first creature was, and he says, the four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. So you get the idea they got a lot of eyes. What? They're not omniscient like God, but they can see every, a lot of stuff, right? You get the impression. Whether whatever it's trying to relay is that these beings, these angelic beings, see, right? The first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, the third creature had a face like that of a man, the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. Do you know the same description is pretty much exactly out of Ezekiel 1? If you get a chance this read, week to read Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 2 goes to heaven, sees these creatures with multiple heads and eyes, and they've got wings. Creatures that would make Hollywood go, nah, that's, that would be too weird. Let's stick with aliens, right? There are angelic beings, which is actually good for us because in Hebrews he talks about it, that they are ministering spirits sent for the sake of the elect in chapter 1. So God uses angels to minister his people. But it's also bad news for mankind, as we'll see in the book of Revelation, because fallen angels, these are holy angels, fallen angels are also described in this book. And John 10.10 says that Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. And so there's fallen angels, and they wreak havoc. And you can look at that. You can look through the Gospels, and what both fallen angels and holy angels are under authority by God. So that even the demoniac who's, who's possessed with demons, he's naked, everything they chain him with, he can break free of because he has demonic power. When he sees Jesus, he falls down and, 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 and they cry out, what do we have to do with you, Jesus? Have you come to torment us before the time? So even demons understand Jesus has authority over them and will ultimately punish them. And so you have these creatures, I'm not going to get into explaining or describing because I don't know. I'm just saying Jesus is not like us and heaven may be different than you and I picture it to be, right? And the four living creatures, each one having six wings, same thing in Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1, these descriptions of angelic beings, full of eyes around and within and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. What I can tell you about this being we call Jesus, though he's not like us, these angelic beings who are way beyond us in strength and their ability to come and go from the presence of God to here, they are way beyond us, and yet they show great reverence and respect, Right? In fact, over and over in this passage, is just worship after worship. He says this in verse 9. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, and the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Lord, and our, our Lord and our God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created so you have these elders, and, and they're seated on these thrones. It's this great honor before God, but, and they bow down, and they throw their crowns before God, which is a sign of what? Submission. Do you know if you recognize and you believe that what John was seeing was a glimpse into heaven, that your life should reflect in all ways submission? It's the Christian life, isn't it? It's learning to submit to a holy God, a being who's way bigger than you've ever imagined to who's way more powerful than you could ever comprehend, who's more terrifying than you ever feared and more loving than you ever imagined. And so Jesus is not like us, right? And so this worship, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created, these angels are just going, man, you, you, it's you. And, and they're saying, you, Jesus, you are the creator. You created everything. You're worthy of glory, honor, respect, and in a day where it's like we tend to sing songs that maybe don't look quite the same, right? See, none of the, none of the thrones around it, the guys weren't going, every step I take, I take in you. You make me move, Jesus. That sounds a little different than holy, worthy, throwing their crowns. You alone control the universe. You made it. You are you, you judge. You are holy. You are righteous. And I'm not 
trying to dog any particular song, even though I brought up a particular song, and I enjoy that song, right, you know, but, but I have to evaluate based on what we're seeing in the heavens. We probably need to evaluate our own singing in light of, we tend to be man-centered. I feel, I just love, I love God. They're all saying, you're terrifyingly holy. In Isaiah 6, they, they, they have these same wings, and they, they cover their eyes even though they've never sinned, and Holy, 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 holy. He, he, he's so beyond holy. He, he's holy beyond even what the angels can look upon, even though they've never sinned. We treat him as way too familiar because we think that Jesus is like us. And we need to understand that Jesus is not like us. Yes, he went through everything. He is our faithful high priest. He felt everything we go through, Hebrews says. And he is compassionate. He's a friend of sinners. But we need to get a reverential attitude towards this God because only in fearing and reverencing him will it really change your life. Will you actually flee from your sin? Will you actually hunger for righteousness? Will you seek to forgive, seek to love, seek to give, seek to prepare yourself because you'll stand in this setting and I'll stand in this setting. And what we talk about today, you will see with your own eyes. If, in fact, you are of God's household. And if not, you will long to see it, but will be cast out when he says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, and I will tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. This is a holy setting for those who love and serve and believe Jesus, right? So he goes into chapter 5. I saw in the... In the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel, this may be Gabriel, we don't know, proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? The seals, as we'll find out, are the terrible judgments. Not a one-time quick deal like in the flood. He starts to open the judgments. And what you find is all the people on earth are like, forget you, God. We don't give a rip about you, God. And as he punishes it, them, he says, and they wouldn't repent, and they wouldn't repent, and they wouldn't repent. So in heaven, you have all these beings going, you're so holy, we wouldn't even look on you. And on earth, you have man going, what the heck do I care? All the way along until God destroys them to the utmost. So he says, and no one in heaven on earth was, or under the earth was able to open the book and take it. Uh, verse 6 and of, of chapter 5 of Revelation, I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. Again, you have the symbol. Of, he, he's as a lamb. Remember G Jesus, the lamb of the tribe, right? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So he's standing in heaven as though slain. And what does that mean? He's still bearing the marks of the fact that he was crucified because of your sin and my sin? Can you think of a more humiliating thing than to be in that setting, worshipped as the highest heights of all the universe, as the creator, owner, and sustainer, as the one who holds the title deed, not only because you bought it, but because you made it? Everyone worshipping you and standing there as a lamb who has been slain, and, and still bearing the marks of humiliation, to pay for the sins of your own creation against you? The lamb is though standing as though slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Again, there's a lot of symbolism in here. We're not going to get into all that. Not that I even could explain all of it. I'm just saying, Jesus is what? Not like us. When you're driving today, you need to remember, Jesus is not like us. When you're offended by somebody this week, you need to remember, Jesus is not like us. When you're tempted to envy or be selfish this week, you need to go, Jesus is not like us. He's different, and i got to stand before him, and he's the one who gave me life, and he's the one who redeemed me, and he still bears the marks of that, what it cost him to redeem me. I need to serve him like the angels. He's worthy of all glory and honor and respect. He's worthy. He's worthy for me to obey him every moment of every day with every thought, word, and deed I say, think, or do, right? He's worthy. He deserves that. It's only appropriate that the one who made all things gets that respect from those whom he made. The angels get it. Mankind typically doesn't, right? And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, 
the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, we're not saying that there's these bowls and all the saints' prayers are like liquid in the bowl. We're saying that he's using symbolism to say, all the prayers, your prayers are meaningful in this, isn't it? They're like incense. There's something that, it's a sweet aroma to God. And so they've been pleading with God because of what? The great suffering, because of the persecution of God's people. In fact, in, later in this book, you will see those who've died for their testimony here on earth, and they're pleading with God, how long, O oh Lord, how long, how long will you let this run on earth? And God says, I've got the perfect time. He goes into verse 9, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Sometimes people say, oh, that's an American God, that's a white people God, that's a this people God, that's an Asian people God. This is a... Listen, in heaven, he says, there will be people, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Some people say, well, what about people over there? What about people over there? Christians are commanded by God to go tell everybody, right? And in time, God will see fit that before the throne of God, in fact, right now, before God's throne, God has been building, right, a chorus of worshipers for his glory from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And before the end comes, he will have accomplished his will of bringing forth the elect from all tribe, tongue, and nation. It is not a God specific to the Jews. It is not a God specific to Americans. It is not a God specific to any race or any people group. It is a people who recognize that Jesus is, in fact, Lord of the universe and God of this world, that he came to this earth, died on the cross, rose again, never to die again, that he stands in heaven as a lamb, what? Once slain. And yet, he says, uh, verse 10, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Verse 11, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Literally, before the throne is this throng of people and, and angels and angelic beings all mixed together worshiping God in ways we can only dream of, right? Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. That one verse, he extols seven characteristics of Jesus. You know what worship is about? It's Jesus-centered, right? It's for Jesus' glory. So in our Hallmark Christianity where we type to think of, our, I want to worship, I want to worship, I want to worship, stop and actually start worshiping. Like extol Jesus for his virtue and his character, and what he's like, that's worship. Worship is ascribing worth. It's worship. It's ascribing worth to someone or something. And you and I worship every moment of every day. Think on what you think on. It's worship because you are thinking on the things that make you happy, the things that really bring you pleasure, the things you're willing to give up your money and your time and your talent for. That is worship. It may not be Jesus, but it's worship. The question is, whether or not that worship is directed to the lamb who once slain, who now rules the universe and is God of our lives. And every created thing which is in heaven on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all the things in them, and I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. But lest you think chapter 5 is the end and every... Like Isaiah says, and the earth is covered with the knowledge of God as the water covers the seas. He's just about to break into the tribulation. He's just about to break into the disaster he has planned for mankind. Because in light of a God who's that perfect and holy, angels get that, right? The holy angels do his bidding perfectly. Fallen angels have rejected him along with the majority of mankind. The question for us today is, if Jesus is not like us, if Jesus is really, if this is, a, this is the heavens have been open to us and we should meditate, number one, I'd encourage you this week, spend some time to read it and just meditate on it. I don't have all the answers for all the symbolism of what is going on, but I can tell you this, Jesus is not like us. And if he really is that being and not just a Jewish peasant, I think there's a reason why everything we should, we should say, am I obeying God? And if not, I should be quick to repent, right? If he's that holy, I should be reading the scriptures every day, and every one of you who seeks holiness is doing that. But not only should you be seeking in the scriptures to understand this holiness of God and how you can be holy, 
I would encourage you and invite others into your life to say, do you see areas where my life is not holy? Because soon enough, I will stand before a holy God. My stepsister this week, just they found her dead. Didn't even have any, just she had, uh, was raising a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. They found her dead. So like that, she moved into eternity, right? And stood before this God. And then yesterday morning, I woke up, and it was, it was like four or something in the morning. I get up, and I heard a noise. I look out, and all the lights are on at my neighbor's house. It's because she had died and moved into a Christless eternity. So today, 150,000 people will leave this earth into eternity. And we already know where they're going. Everyone is born with a beginning and no ending. They're either going into heaven to join the, the chorus of myriads and of angels and worshipers, or they're going to hell with the majority of people. Because narrow is the way that leads to life, and few find it, but broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many go that way. Ours is, man, God saved us. This God, this being, this Jesus who is not like us, saved me by humbling himself even to the point of becoming a Jewish peasant and dying on a cross. We can't even imagine how humiliating it was for him to become a man, right? Because we're born in his image, we're created in his image, but he's way different than us. So I would encourage you today, in light of where you're headed, in light of where everyone around you is headed, in light of what he's like, and then I, the angels get it, they cover their eyes, they worship, the, the 24 elders get it, they throw their crowns, they show their submission, I would invite you to think about, before we take communion, are there any areas of your life that don't reflect submission to God? If we're honest, all of us have them. The question is just where, right? And, and I would encourage you just to spend some time praying. Read this, and, and sometimes I've just been praying this week going, God, like somehow I need to connect the dots more deeply in my heart. You've thrown open the doors of heaven. Let me look in. And, and it may not be what I would have expected, but you wanted me to know that so that I will get myself ready to stand before a holy God. You need to be ready to stand before a holy God. So I just encourage you and invite you before we take communion to spend some time praying. If God is really not like us and we have to go and stand before him and in fact get to, we want that to be a good day. We want to be humbly pursuing in the word of God a knowledge of him. In fact, even as difficult as chapter 4 and 5 are, we are commanded by God to know the word of God and do it. So I'd encourage you to meditate on how can you do, how can you change your thinking or actions based on the fact that Jesus is not like us. Like I say, I don't have all the answers for a lot of the symbolism in there, but I can tell you, we're heading into an eternity and we're going to meet a God, Jesus Christ, and he's not like us. Let me pray for us. Father, I just come and when I read these things and meditate on them, I'm, I'm baffled by the extravagance of what John got to see. I'm amazed by the fearsomeness that you sit on a throne, Jesus, and there's, there's lightning and thunder, and there's all this stuff that going on, a lot of symbolism as well, but just this fearsomeness and this holiness that even angelic beings who, who have never sinned, all they can do is just praise you, holy, holy, holy. God, I suspect as you look on our hearts this morning with penetrating eyes and a fire as you move around and through your churches this morning with burnished brown, bronze feet to admonish, but also to offer rewards for those who are faithful. I suspect you see things in our hearts and minds that reflect that maybe we've become way too uh, complacent with you. We don't want to be like the Laodicean church, lukewarm. We don't want like the Ephesians, the Ephesus church that lost its first love. We want to have a, a reverence and a respect in our worship, in our prayer, in our words, in our thoughts, in our deeds, that reflects that we know we're going to be with you. And I pray you'd motivate us in light of what you've told us about the end, that we'd go tell everybody and anybody who will listen that you will save to the utmost all who will repent and believe your gospel. Thank you for saving us. We praise you, Lamb of God. Holy, holy, holy are you. May our lives more and more reflect that that's true. In Jesus' name. Take a moment to pray and then take communion.